Good morning. And welcome to our first session from Jeroen. Something like that. <laughs> um, about conducting COVID, something that it was far too long to remember at that early hour. So please welcome. Even I remember. surprised to see so many of you <laughs> over here at Saturday morning. I'm actually also a little bit surprised that I'm here myself. Um, some of you might have not expected this, but well, if duty calls, you need to go. Um, today, uh, in this three quarters of an hour, I would like to have a small discussion uh, about um, cooperating uh, in Debian and uh, especially uh, how to get work done better uh, with a complete proof. Uh, Debian is a great operating system and I believe um, this greatness is in a big part uh, thanks to uh, the lots of the huge amount of developers that are working together to integrate Debian into one universal operating system. Debian does not consist of a lot of different uh, sorts of packages. Uh, well, actually it does, but they work very well together. Uh, this wouldn't be possible if developers wouldn't uh, communicate with each other or wouldn't uh, make rules um, so that um, the packages actually uh, are nicely integrated and would work immediately uh, once installed. Um, In order to remain uh, this um, Debian to be the, the biggest, the greatest operating system around, uh, it is very essential to be able to remain um, cooperating um, in the packages, uh, between packages, um, to have this. Uh, the Debian policy is um, an important, important part of, uh, of this work. Uh, the Debian policy, however, uh, is not so very easy to change. Uh, the problem is that uh, you cannot actually simply use the Debian policy to enforce changes uh, on, the, on Debian itself. Uh, it would make um, way too many packages immediately buggy if you would change the policy into something that isn't yet reality. Um, and also um, the policy editors, and I think rightfully, do not consider the policy the place to actually enforce large-scale changes in Debian. But there needs to be a way to actually improve um, Debian uh, altogether and to make new policy. So um, for this to happen, um, developers need to come together to discuss um, what would actually be uh, useful things to modify in Debian. Um, in recent years, at least the years that I have been involved in Debian, which is not terribly long, I realize, uh, I noticed that um, whenever something a bit controversial is being discussed on a large uh, mailing list like Debian Devil, Debian Vote or Debian Flame. Uh, this will actually not really re often result in very constructive uh, conclusions. There will certainly be a lot of constructive replies, but um, due to the nature of email and the tendency of people to always reply to the latest email in a thread, uh, this will not so often lead to really uh, good conclusions, consensus, uh, also, people have a bit uh, sometimes difficulty actually um, in a later moment in the thread admitting that they have been convinced by others and um, changed their stance on certain issues. Um, as a sort of workaround, what happens often, and I think too often now, is that only in small groups 
uh, either in real life or on IRC or on the smaller mailing list, issues, uh, controversial issues are being discussed because that makes it possible uh, to discuss without having uh, immediately a big flame. Uh, but there are big disadvantages to that. Uh, and very good example of this is what happened in Vancouver. Um, it was seen in general that the release of Debian was not really progressing uh, very fast and it took us very long to release. Uh, on the, but on a big mailing list like Debian Devil or whatever, um, there was not the trust that it would help to discuss this then. There would be a huge threat. Uh, there have been several in the past. And um, in order to, uh, to look constructively into what could be um, improved, uh, some people came together to actually uh, look, meet in real life and talk about it. Uh, the disadvantage here is quite obvious. Not everyone who is interested is being involved, uh, which can easily lead to, um, yeah, you can call it PR issues, but actually it is simply uh, an issue that um, there is conclusions being reached that are not necessarily understood or agreed upon by the Debian developers as a whole. Uh, complete the uh, conclusions that everyone agrees on is not possible at all anyway, but um, at least a broad consensus should be possible. Okay, uh, this is a birds of feather session, so it's actually not a talk, and I would like to um, invite you all to uh, discuss a bit about what um, possible means we could implement to, to improve uh, the Debian mailing lists, for example, uh, to be able to actually get, um, get technical and controversial issues uh, resolved in a doable manner. Um, good. Uh, first, I would like to know whether uh, other specific uh, people here that uh, have very strong ideas already on one of those issues. Would you raise your hand? Too early, I guess, for that. Never mind. Good. Um, there are several ways to... Um, apparently, on mailing lists, um, it is very hard for people in general uh, to moderate themselves. Uh, there are other communication forms where that is not really a problem. In real life, you have a necessary um, issue that only one person can speak at the same time. You can give uh, non-verbal signals and um, and in this way, uh, you prevent uh, very long and heated threats because there's simply limited bandwidth available. Um, on IRC, um, that bandwidth is a little bit more available. There are also no uh, non-verbal signals on IRC. So in that way, it is very much more similar than mailing lists. Uh, it also can involve uh, basically everyone with an uh, internet uh, connection, uh, although admittingly not e e everyone who has uh, access to email has also access to IRC, but it's still reasonable similar. Uh, the only difference with IRC is that on IRC it is uh, accepted um, to actually moderate discussions. Um, every channel had usually um, an operator, and this, um, this operator can actually uh, tell people that uh, are um, not being constructive um, to, to lower their voice or lower the frequency of saying something. You were talking about uh, the threats on Devel earlier, and you said that no real conclusion is reached, uh, and that goes for other mailing lists as, uh, as well, I guess. Um, what I think you would hope uh, will happen is, even if there's no public conclusion on the list, 
that the person or persons who started the threat will get a sense of uh, the balance and the ideas within Debian by reading through the threat and taking that to, into account into the final decision. What may be missing is something like a summary mail from the persons who initiated the threat uh, to say, okay, I've read this and this and this, and my conclusion are this and this and this, and I'm going to do that uh, with my packages or whatever. Um, and I think that that could work. It could result, of course, in a new flame war uh, if there are very strong opinions about the end result. But that would be an indication that it really has not been resolved. So that could be maybe one way uh, to do this, uh, maybe by formalizing uh, such a summary mail uh, in, in a kind of uh, netiquette or list ticket. Uh, so yeah, I'd like I to get some feedback on that. Yeah, I think you make a very good point. Um, you address at least one uh, issue that uh, there's not a definite conclusion. There are other issues with uh, email discussions that are still uh, they're not really uh, solved, like uh, the volume of a thread can still be very large uh, because of what uh, not everyone who might be interested is actually motivated enough to read all of the messages. And uh, there's also also a mailing list, a uh, little represent, uh, representative problem uh, because uh, typically, or typically, it happens a lot that um, the most vocal posters on the mailing list are not necessarily uh, the persons that are most active in the project, which in theory shouldn't matter as long as simple arguments are posted, but um, in practice I think this does matter. But the conclusion mail uh, is a good way. It's a little bit difficult to, to see when a thread has really ended. Um, right. Someone else thoughts about this? Okay. Oh. One idea that's been suggested one idea that's been suggested is to, um, if you find someone who's just going off on tangents on a thread or who isn't being constructive, to just send them a private mail, letting them know that you feel they're being that way, and hopefully if enough people do it, they'll get the message. Yes, um, this is actually, as far as I can tell, um, I do it myself also, uh, sometimes, not too often, um, being done. Um, it does not always have effect. And there are, I mean, in some cases, like for example, the incidents on the Debian women lists of late with some troll uh, about death to women's rights or something, it's a very clear cut case that someone is uh, not interested in constructive discussion at all. And then the, the step. Uh, for list masters to take to actually ban someone from the list is an easy one to take and in this case has also been taken. Um, there are a lot of uh, much more borderline cases where this is uh, not really doable or feasible, especially if s people who are otherwise um, generally contributing um, might end up being a little bit overheated when they strongly disagree with a certain uh, email <coughs> or whatever. Um, some technique that has in the past been implemented by the list masters, uh, which is yeah, quite an interesting way to go about this, is uh, imposing delays on the mailing list of a few hours of specific persons, of specific threads. This keeps this gets the tempo out of a mailing, mailing of a thread because and actually it mainly forces people in a way to think a bit more for before they uh, send an email. Um, one step further would be to actually really moderate people, which is traditionally not really 
um, something that people like. Uh, free speech has been uttered often in this context. And sheer volume. And sheer volume, yes. Um, that comes together with um, how you, um, with, yeah, it's a borderline case if someone uh, does not have something really con constructive to contribute uh, and still uh, sends a mail like me too or repeats previously said arguments that, for example, the, uh, the person which that is a reply to did not understand or read. Um, yeah, sheer volume is one of the big issues. Um, delays help. Are there other techniques <coughs> or moderation maybe? <coughs> Telling people about their not always uh, very constructive emails. Good. Um, you can also compare the, the way email mailing lists uh, are going about in Debian, which are said to be uh, quite unfriendly. Uh, Frans Bob has something to say. I think another way to reach uh, decisions maybe uh, on major issues is to create uh, semi-formal or formal sub-projects. Because you see that uh, in, if you define a sub-project, people that are interested in the subject will get involved. And then you might try to reach a consensus within the sub-project, create a mailing list for it. Uh, people can subscribe to that, follow the discussions uh, done within the sub-project, sub and when a conclusion has been reached, it can be implemented within the rest of the project. Yes, it is um, actually simply creating mailing lists with a lower number of, subs of subscribers, uh, because um, it's actually a workaround for big mailing lists. Um, you note that uh, on smaller mailing lists, there is a much less problem of discussions getting out of hand. And uh, if you would have smaller groups of people, a special mailing list for a specific discussion, uh, you would actually work around the problem by simply not discussing them on a big list. The problem is, um, how to discover in time that a certain discussion is going to be big. There's no way actually really to move a discussion from one list to the other. It generally fails horribly, even though um, headers like mail follow-up too exist. Um, so the idea is good, it has been suggested before, but I have no really idea how you would best go to really implement this if you're not foreseeing something that is going to be a big discussion. Um, I feel it, would it should not only be creating a mailing list and move it, trying to move the thread there. Uh, it should be defining a sub-project and creating a mailing list for that project. Uh, so effectively, you hold discussion on the subject, create the project, find people from the thread uh, that would like to get involved, uh, publish information about the sub-project, try to get others through other channels uh, that were not in the initial discussion but may be interested in uh, the subject to also subscribe to the project and then start pro the discussion new. It would not work for, for minor technical issues, but I think it would work and it would make uh, major changes in the project 
uh, a lot easier to, to do. Uh, it would maybe cost a little time, but if you see that the current method is not reaching any conclusion, and you just see that the same subject is started over again about a year later or half a year later, and you get the same big flame war that was already done a year before, I think in the end it may get better results. And it would uh, avoid the, the thing you said at the beginning, that uh, you will get very small groups that are going to try to decide things in private. Yes, um, I think it's indeed uh, a good idea to split up uh, maybe certain parts of decision making in smaller groups. Uh, you have something to say now? Yeah, I'll take this one. Yeah. Um, I've, I've actually seen some of these small groups being created as a result of some frictions and also as a result of certain needs. And um, in, in very many cases, the productivity has been very low of these small groups because as I, I take some credit for some of them, um, for the non-functioning. Um, and I, I would like to know maybe, especially from Franz and maybe Joey as well, because I know you two have been in this um, Debian startup group, which has basically been addressing a major problem in Debian. And you have, from what I can tell, put together a very productive group. Maybe you have some, some tips that made this group be so productive, something that would help other groups reach that same productivity because just you know just just creating saying let's guys let's work on this here's a new mailing list um, I'm gonna work on this and anybody else who wants to join please go on that's just not gonna do it at least not in my experience same same happens with me uh, with Deptex we had the same idea split it in a different sub project but then we are like five or six of them very small oh okay uh, where five <laughs> I thought like make it short um, th there's like five or six of them very small and there's conversation that could be interesting to other Debian developers who don't subscribe to yet another mailing list because like there's too many and so I come to DebConf, give a talk, and I get really nice feedback from people who've always been around but not in the DebTex mailing list. So maybe one of the ideas that's been proposed is first creating a sub-project with a subject tag in Debian Devel so that the discussion is still like open to people, and when it gets major, you, you move it away. But then other ints are very much appreciated in this because bootstrapping a sub-project is not that easy in my view. Yes, uh, Debian, DFL and Big Mainis have, because of the nature, um, a very big audience and for a lot of uh, smaller projects, uh, smaller issues in Debian, it is very worthwhile, I think, to have the general opinion of uh, yeah, people generally interested in Debian. That is why those lists exist, to discuss general development-related issues or for Debian project, project-related issues. Um, for everyone uh, interested in such general discussions to be able to participate, the disadvantage is the volume, but the advantage is exactly yeah, very related to that. Uh, that you get a lot of different opinions and because of the large group you get uh, sometimes also very valuable contributions. Um, it, it still doesn't really solve the problem of course. Um, some people uh, you can wonder whether um, this is very uh, person related, um, the way people behave uh, on mailing lists. Uh, it has sometimes been noted um, that when a discussion, a big discussion is running out of hand, one or two, no, always at least two uh, or three uh, people very, um, very interested or very with very specific ideas about a certain subject, uh, want to continue to get their point across and to convince others uh, by mostly repeating arguments, uh, drag a discussion to a place that is not really 
uh, productive anymore. Um, and now I lost my, my uh, If I could break in, I, I, one thing that I've found works pretty well if you're, if you're still in the process, it's still in the point in the process where you're on a large mailing list and you're trying to get something going is to, I mean, first of all, you really have to take, somebody has to take some kind of a leadership role and, you know, try to point people in a constructive direction. And then you need to find a way to recognize people out of the thread who are actually doing something. For example, when I started the secure testing stuff, it was all done on, I believe, um, Debian release and Debian security mailing lists, which aren't really high volume, but still, um, I found people who were who posted to the thread and then who I managed to convince to go on and do other things. And that, that's a good way to build up a team while you're on those lists. Yes. For careful readers of big threads, um, you can uh, fish out the interesting people, the people that have valuable contributions, and then select them to go further in, uh, in a smaller project and more constructive. Um, sometimes it will be a very big threat, and then it will, for also very interested people, not be possible to actually read everything. Um, I myself, for example, still didn't read and probably never will read uh, most of the threads that happened after the Vancouver thingy was posted because it was simply way too much and it quite quickly um, became the signal to ro noise ratio was too low for me to actually find the interesting post in it. So uh, while you can still find the valuable contributions if you have time enough, um, the disadvantage of yeah, the, the high level of noise, um, you won't solve that way. Uh, yes, I, I believe it works. Okay, I believe Martin asked specifically about um, Project Scud, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that, that you find it to be successful. I think those of us within it um, pretty much can only see our frustrations because we have such um, high ambitions. Um, we'd been thinking we'd be able to get together for, per for periodic real-time uh, meetings and given the time zone spread that we have and the extremely busy schedules of some of us, uh, that's turned out to be difficult. So what our working pattern has fallen into is, uh, is we rely upon a few resources. We rely upon a subversion repository, a, ma a mail alias, it's not a mailing list, um, and uh, an IRC. And what IRC is useful for is just um, for us to brainstorm with each other or just drop a note, uh, to, to, uh, just floating ideas, seeing if something's crazy, or just finding out the status of something that's going on. It's the kind of thing that people do all the time with queries uh, privately with each other in IRC. We just uh, have a channel for it and we use it for that. Um, I personally think there's a lot of benefit in SCUD, and which is probably applicable to small teams, in that the the sense of accountability you get to a small team is is different. It's not that people don't feel accountable to a large project. I certainly feel uh, uh, pretty accountable to the entire uh, body of Debian developers, but it's difficult uh, mentally. Maybe uh, maybe this has something to do with Enrico's seven plus or minus two rule, and I'm not joking. Um, it's difficult to conceive of a one-on-one -on -one accountability relationship to a thousand Debian developers. It's very easy to think of myself as accountable to the other members of Project SCUD. So if I'm dragging on something, if I'm not being responsive, um, it's, it's, it's very easy, since I know these guys in person now, everybody except Steve Langasek, who I've known on IRC for years, so that's almost as good, uh, it's very easy to feel a sense of personal connection and responsibility to them. And so, in a way, they serve by proxy to represent the project to me. That certainly doesn't mean I do without uh, communications with the rest of the project. I try very hard to do that and maintain a personal relationship with as many people in the project as I can. But again, you, you can only keep so many items in your head. And it, it does me some good to know that there are these uh, six people, uh, you know, uh, basically keeping a close eye on me. Um, is that helpful? Does that give you a little more insight into how things work? Yeah. Um, it kind of does. I mean, yeah. we'll give you the mic. 
It's it's rather difficult to respond to that because um, my the the kind of teams I was talking about is more like you know project related, like some sort of like um, small packaging area or something like that. I mean, maybe I haven't made myself perfectly clear, and then you kind of answer with Project Scud, which is sort of on top of everything else. But I I kind of I kind of understand what you're getting at. It's and the you are, from what I understand, Project Scott pushes for, for openness or tries to push for openness. And um, I, I think I'm at a different level. I'm even before getting to that stage where openness is even important. I think it's more about a motivation thing. It's more about a coordination and, and yeah, I, I, I can't really formulate it properly. It's more about a, I think it's mo motivation more. Um, I how to keep people together and actually make them realize and, and work on something. I guess I, I was talking, <laughs> if I say earlier today, I don't actually know what day I'm referring to. <laughs> but if, <laughs> <laughs> so if I say earlier today, I was talking to someone, um, and um, so that was yesterday. Um, and basically, Debian is all about the like, you know, if you don't like what's currently going on, go and do something about it. Don't complain or don't talk about it. And, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is the, um, the, the kind of person that goes ahead and, and creates a mailing list and creates a web page and, and yeah. creates a nice project name and goes ahead and does and pretends to do something and then actually doesn't do something. Whereas, um, on the other hand, those that actually get to achieve things in Debian, um, even with other people, are those that actually do something, even if it's, you know, it's like underground. Like you, yeah. It's not visible. There is no mailing list in the beginning. It's completely like unorganized um, but those I, I guess that is kind of like how a lot of the most successful projects in Debian got started yeah. and um, actually carried through until then at one point in time somebody said well you know now it's about time we can actually create one of those mailing lists but it's this initial stage that of how to get people together how to actually make people believe that in fact it's not important L let me back up for just a second. Um, one of the important po there's there's a book called Understanding Open Source Development by Fitzgerald and Joseph Heller, and one of the main points they harp on is um, the m the main reason we are all sitting here in this room is because we are being recognized for what we do. That that seems sort of to be to be sort of one of the main motivations of open source development, um, and if you actually sit down to do something without a lot of visibility, without a lot of publicity, then um, you're not getting that recognition. And yet, yeah. a lot of people are actually managing to do this, to, to pull other people together. I mean, I, I completely understand that the, the idea of like whether I am actually going to bitch about a problem or talk about how a problem could be solved is completely different from whether I actually managed to sit down and fix a problem. That is an entirely different issue for me. It, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is how do you get other people to work on that same problem? How do you make other people, how do you motivate them? And that is the reason why I don't really see an answer in, in your explanation of Project Scud. I Which see personally Project Scud more as, um, well it's not entirely the same, but uh, it is in some ways very uh, similar to developers simply uh, discussing issues over a beer in informal ad hoc groups. Um, it's a bit of a meta discussion trying to see where uh, problems are and which people are maybe uh, good to put together to actually work on an issue. I think that is a more important uh, function for project-wide, I mean, next to the function of um, um, giving uh, uh, a way of, um, of Brandon Robson to reflect ideas upon, uh, then actually discussing and solving the issues as Project Scud itself. You had something to say? Yeah, to at the risk of making this the Martin Craft and Brandon show, um, I w then let me That's try to. My show. Since since you since you right exactly it's your show, um, so since you've clarified what you're talking about a little more, let me let me offer my thoughts. I think 
Um, I think part of the problem comes from a couple of good-natured instincts, which is that in this project of a lot of openness, we want to bring things out onto the table. And sometimes it's difficult to identify a problem area without being perceived as complaining, no matter how you couch it, no matter how diplomatic your language. And yet, that is exactly the kind of thing you have to do if you aren't already strongly socially networked and you don't know who to turn to to build a, a community around your problem. You're wondering, how do we get a small team off the ground to tackle a problem? Well, if you don't already know who cares about it, the only way you can find out is to go ask. So I think you look like, I'm, you're looking at me like I'm speaking utter bullshit, so. <laughs> <what>? <laughs> I'm just wondering whether that actually works in Debian. Well, I think, I think that's a good. Oh, okay. He's wondering he's, whether, he's wondering whether He's wondering whether that actually works in Debian. And um, I'm trying to think of a case where I've done that personally, and uh, I'm not thinking of one. But <laughs> um, I'm not coming up with one. But I mean, what's the alternative? To, to stay quiet or to labor alone in a silo, hit some brick wall, and then not be able to get anything done because you've reached the limits of your personal knowledge? Um, as we've scaled up in the project, as we've gotten so large, the number of people who are able to editorialize on something has grown faster than the number of people that can uh, reasonably work together on something. You know, because the, the optimal size for a small team, as as, as um, Andreas is fond of pointing out, is you know, is, it's in the low in, in single integers, probably single digit integers, probably uh, maybe as many as nine people. Again, we have Enrico's principle. I, this is the everything principle. It explains everything. Seven plus or minus two. <laughs> Anyway, um, but, you know, so in the early days of the Debian project, that was a significant slab of people working on anything. Um, but, but now, you know, you might be able to have nine people working on something, but 999 just being able to do armchair commentary. And one of the things that makes it difficult is not all of that commentary can be thrown away. A lot of it is insightful and useful. And I think a lot of people get paralyzed from taking action because they do know that. They know they've got to put together some, they've got to get together with their peers to solve a problem, and they don't want to exclude those who have meaningful feedback. But if you, you know, if you spend time grappling with every single um, point of cri critique that comes up, you will never get anything done. And I don't have a magic bullet for dealing with that apart from uh, just, you know, advocating a bit of. Um, egotism on the part of the person trying to get something done to just bull forward uh, and, 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 and try to achieve something positive. At the same time, you've got to have the, the you know, intellectual maturity to realize when you failed and yeah. to try to help other people learn from your mistake. Um, I remember the, uh, the NM talk the other day where you know, we had various approaches to the NM process until it stopped working. So. Um, it's not easy, but I think if we can articulate the challenges involved in getting these kinds of things done, it might lower the level of acrimony just a little bit. I'm hopeful that way anyway. So anyway, I've talked long enough. Yeah, about the seven plus minus two uh, thing, it's indeed difficult uh, for on mailing lists yeah, to get uh, short to the point friends. But if you look at other projects, um, it actually seems to not always be impossible to do so. Uh, I have not really read a lot of uh, Ubuntu lists, but rumor has it that it has uh, a certain uh, amount less flames and can actually reach a lot easier consensus on it. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. I have a few ideas. I'm wondering whether someone has a real maybe a more funded idea of why it in Ubuntu might work better than in Debian at the moment. Ubuntu is of course quite new. Enrico. It would be interesting to have Meiko in the crowd, but I guess, I guess he's not. He's not awake yet. <laughs> so I can try to repeat like the two or three arguments I've heard in the past. And quite bl repeat them quite blindly because I've only been involved in a very minor mailing list in the Ubuntu community which was a bit special and well point number one was that uh, when Ubuntu has begun it's begun on top of the Ubuntu community guideline 
Um, and the, 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 the Ubuntu name itself has a strong uh, community related meaning. Uh, Ubuntu means uh, being kind towards others and understanding that you are nothing as, it, as yourself and you only have a meaning in the context of a community and kind of like losing the boundary, I mean, uh, weakening the boundaries that separate the, the individual with the community. That's like the meaning of Ubuntu. Uh, kind of you can also what? try it. I said, so they're the Borg, man. Borg? <laughs> Star Trek. Anyway, forget Ah, that. the Borg, yeah. yeah. Kind of, uh -huh. wow. Um, so, uh, it's well, the, one th the guideline has, like, shaped the, s the, the community a bit. And, and when, like, uh, a, a thread gets flamish, someone tends to invoke the guideline and bring it back on track. And another one, like, in the development side that's been said, is that they have a strong leadership, as in, well, I don't pay you anymore if you're an asshole. Uh, which helps to deal with the yeah. craziest cases. I think one other issue is what is also involved. And a smaller community. There is? And a smaller community. There they is smaller. Mo they are smaller. The oh, they are smaller. Right, yes. Uh, Ubuntu is uh, very new, uh, while Debian is already uh, 12 years old or something. And uh, Debian. Discussions on Debian, I don't think they always used to be... Um, yeah, Debian used to be smaller, of course, so then discussions could be productiver. And you also notice it in the involvement of a number of uh, key Debian contributors who contribute a lot for, like, often around 10 years. Um, how much do you see, for example, BDL post on a Debian devil mailing list? Not really often, and uh, I have the feeling this used to be more if uh, if you look back at uh, the archives. Um, maybe Ubuntu will end up the same way as Debian would be. Uh, it's hard to say, future will tell. But what Ubuntu started out from the beginning, and um, that is of course in a big part uh, thanks to the hindsight that the Ubuntu community creators have because they have Debian to look at and see what is uh, actually not running so optimally in Debian is the immediate creation of a code of conduct and applying it uh, quite strongly. And one could wonder whether it would be a good ide idea to have the same in Debian. If you have such uh, guidelines of what is acceptable, we do have a list policy but it's actually quite uh, and not enforced at all. I mean, it also has some spam policy thing that is quite obviously completely unenforceable. So it's a little bit a joke. And the real community guidelines would be um, a good way to actually uh, also uh, stop the minor contributions uh, of people that don't, do not have uh, very much constructive things to say. So I myself would be quite in favor for such a, um, uh, yeah, to introduce a sort of code of conduct on the mailing list that is uh, more or less being voluntarily enforced uh, by simply telling people about uh, violations. Um, may I have a small quick vote by hand raising? Uh, who would f think initially like, yeah, such a, a uh, code of conduct for Debian would be a good idea. Um, who would think that a code of conduct in Debian for mailing lists would be a good idea to have, to introduce? Okay, who we'll do some... Yeah. yeah, I mean a real one. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, really. We, we might need to expand it, but I mean, we, we do take... Yeah, I... Yeah, but the, the current one is not really adequate. And if you compare it with the text of, for example, the Ubuntu Code of Guidelines, uh, it doesn't cover the social aspects or, as or in refrain from posting when you know not have anything really valuable to contribute, etc. Uh, other people who think it would be a bad idea to have a code of conduct on the mailing list? None? Sorry? You, you think the current situation is basically okay? 
No, I don't. But that doesn't mean that any conceivable social code of contact we post is going to fix it or make Debian a better place. It's really difficult to to I mean to regulate speech in this in this fashion, and um, I think people would be uncomfortable with the idea of having a team of commissars who subjectively evaluate things like, well, you have nothing useful to add, um, or you know you're you're just excessively bad. We're going to kick you out. I mean. The way in Ubuntu uh, the code of conduct is actually enforced is not by having some uh, set of moderators or whatever that actually apply this uh, code of conduct to the mailing list members, but actually by simple um, people on the mailing list informing the poster of their violation of the code of conduct. And because it's simply stated as fact that it will be enforced in whatever way, people will tend to listen to that. Well, we, we try to do the same thing with the social contract and the Debian free software guidelines, and that doesn't impress some people either. They say it's just a mantra that we're reciting, and they keep on blathering. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want I, I to be too negative about it, but... I, yeah, the, the, those, I, I, those social contracts uh, and DFHG, but especially social contract is not specific to communication in Debian. No, but they're sometimes used on Debian legal as an attempt to stop a thread, and sometimes they do, but often they don't, because yeah. someone just wants to keep going. I'm very sorry, uh, we, we lost the time. Uh, the <laughs> for the first time, we totally forgot about the time, maybe I because we are all in, well, long I had, so. in the discussion. Thank you. I'm sorry, there were uh, questions left, but uh, sorry, we are over time, so... Yeah.